Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to this. Uh, actually, it's the last talk of the tutorial series uh, uh, that we've had since uh, um, since uh, the first day of the conference, and, and we're ending the tutorial series today. There have been uh, there were eleven tutorials, and this is this is the final one. Um, uh, today's uh, our uh, tutorial presenter is 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 Professor Hui Yang, uh, and he is. Um, uh, professor in the Harold and Ing Harold and Ing Marcus Department of uh, Industrial and uh, Manufacturing Engineering at the Pennsylvania State University. Uh, Dr. Yang also currently serves as the director of the Penn State National Science Foundation Center for Healthcare Organization uh, Transformation, um, also abbreviated as CHOT. Uh, Dr. Yang's research interests focus on sensor-based modeling and analysis of complex systems for process monitoring, process control, system, dyna system diagnostics, condition prognostics, uh, uh, quality improvement, and performance optimization. Uh, he has received no numerous prestigious uh, uh, awards and grants, and, the, and he has received especially the uh, National Science Foundation Career Grant. Uh, he is also a fellow of the Institute of Industrial Engineers, Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers, the IISC Society. Um, and he has served on various uh, prominent editorial uh, positions in, in, in several journals. He has also co-authored the 2016 book, uh, Healthcare Analytics, From Data to Knowledge to Healthcare Improvement. Um, so I will uh, allow uh, Dr. Yang now to uh, present his tutorial. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, thank Harry for the introduction. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the editorial team of Informs Tutorial and a wonderful uh, editorial team. And it's my great pleasure to uh, present my research, Mining Nonlinear Dynamics in Operational Data for Process in, uh, Improvement. And uh, for codes and the details, and uh, please see this paper, and the source code, uh, the links, and open source MATLAB, MATLAB toolbox are available in this PDF and uh, in this paper. So this is the outline of today's tutorial talk. First, I'm gonna talk about advanced sensing and how it is related to industrial engineering, and also how to go from sensor to uh, process monitoring, process modeling, and process control. Then I will dive into nonlinear dynamics, uh, logistic map, geometric syncing, and Tegan's uh, embedding theory. And uh, after that, I'm gonna talk about uh, recurrence theory, and also self-organizing network. And in the end, I will conclude this uh, tutorial. So first, please allow me to introduce Penn State Industrial Engineering. So uh, this is a plate uh, in the uh, campus, which shows uh, Penn State IE is the nation's first academic department for bachelor degree and established uh, in 1909. So our department, first department head is uh, Hugo uh, Dimer, and also he's a close colleague and a friend of Frederick Tyler. Uh, father of scientific uh, management. I want to highlight uh, Frederick Tyler, uh, who is basically, uh, uh, people also call him the father of industrial engineering. So there's a very well-known book called Principles of Scientific Management. So why scientific management? Because in the book, Fre Frederick Tyler uh, advocate uh, all uh, strongly recommend the data measurement, for example, the timing of every job that we accomplished in the manufacturing plant. So we emphasize, uh, he emphasized the data measurement and uh, the integration with manufacturing engineering. So this book marks the debut of industrial engineering. So let's have a look at uh, the sensing before. In 100 years ago, and the sensing today, Obviously, they are very much different. And uh, sensor today, we have uh, wireless sensors and uh, supervisory control and data acquisition systems. So complex system lab is uh, a lab that I run at Penn State. And uh, in the complex system lab, I run two parallel research programs. One is manufacturing, the other one is uh, Healthcare. So manufacturing uh, research program is primarily funded by NSF and uh, recently healthcare program uh, funded by National Institute of Health. But we focus on uh, going from sensors 
to models and then to the decision making optimization of the uh, systems. And the theoretical foundation is nonlinear dynamics, and uh, which I'm going to talk about how to mine nonlinear dynamics in operational data, and uh, statistics, signal processing, uh, simulation optimization, and control theory. So here's an example of advanced sensors we are using today. This is my first project. I worked with General Motors, and uh, General Motors actually have a lot of programmer, uh, programmable logic controllers, which connect a lot of data and control the process. Uh, in the uh, assembly line. And uh, we pull the data from the automotive uh, assembly line and then build the simulation models based on the data. So this is first set of sensors and in the manufacturing plant. And this is a second set example uh, from ultra precision machining. And uh, as we can see, uh, this is what I did before uh, with acoustic emission, vibration, and the cutting force sensors. With all the sensors, we can control the uh, process and uh, especially the machining surface. We want an ultra precision uh, finish of the uh, uh, work pieces. And recently, additive manufacturing, digital manufacturing, in order to control the process uh, and also increase information visibility, we put uh, spectrum sensors, high speed videos, and the layer wise imaging and acoustic sensors in the additive manufacturing machine. And uh, recently, I just uh, finished my sabbatical from uh, Fulbright program. Uh, in the Fulbright program, this is what I did in the Fulbright program. And uh, we have laser powder bed fusion, so metal powders. And then we uh, use laser to, fu to fuse one layer of the powder to form one layer of the uh, metal uh, parts. But we had a new idea, and uh, what we, we know when we do the document print, and we, we can also do the scanning. We have document printer and scanner in one. But uh, currently, there is no metal 3D printer and scanner in one. So what I propose is to leverage the contact imaging sensors. That's the sensor we have in the document scanner. I put it over here. So every time when we finish one layer, fusing, then we can also scan this layer to see the quality that we, we have just uh, fabricated in this layer. Yeah. So detailed information are available in these uh, two papers. And uh, this is another example uh, of advanced sensing in healthcare uh, area. So this is a simulation model I developed for human heart and uh, electric, electric wave uh, conduction and propagation through the human heart and uh, also the pharmaceutical engineering, and uh, we collect a lot of data in the process. And uh, one uh, classical example is the sweetheart problem, because uh, I had a one NSF project specifically focused on the uh, diabetic like complications on the human heart. And uh, then I studied the how glycosylation, basically the sugars and the glycosylation process, how does it impact the ion channels? And some of them, then the ion flow got impacted. Then the heart electric conduction and propagation also got impacted. And then how, how do we design drug to counterbalance this diabetic effect? And uh, definitely we know EKG, a, which stands for electrocardiogram. And we can connect uh, EKG from the heart and see how heart is responding to the treatment and to the surgery and also how it is functioning, and we can do the variable monitoring of the heart. And recently, uh, during the Fulbright program, and I, uh, I wrote a book and, uh, with my PhD student, uh, Bing Yao, who is now an uh, assistant professor at University of Tennessee, uh, uh, Knoxville. And I focus on the concept sensing, modeling, and optimization of cardiac systems. I, I'm a strong believer that we should connect OR theory with front-end sensor connections and also statistic models. And then a coherent like framework of sensing, modeling, and optimization of manufacturing or healthcare systems. So we have complex systems in manufacturing or healthcare. Now we put advanced sensors, uh, Internet of Things, and, uh, and uh, wireless sensors, uh, supervisory data acquisition, and uh, control system. And now we have 
uh, operational data, and uh, now we call it big data. And uh, why it is, uh, when it's big, we want to extract useful information from the data and also derive new knowledge so that it increase our understanding of the uh, system and then help us to uh, optimize our decisions. But naturally, we love and accept synthetic data, linear, stationary, clean, continuous data. Uh, and uh, sometimes we call it curated data. And uh, the data is not well cura uh, curated. All data is, uh, are not clean. However, in the real world, in many cases that we are facing, the natural systems, they are highly nonlinear, non-stationary, and with noise and intermittent switching behaviors. And uh, yeah. Now let's dive into the nonlinear dynamics. There is a need for us to look into nonlinear dynamics in the operational data. So dynamic system is a rule uh, for time evolution uh, on a state space. So state, what is a state space? Let's first define state space. State space is all possible states of the system. And then the state is a d-dimensional vector defining the state of the dynamic system at a fixed time t. And we can represent in the state with a d-dimensional vector. The dynamics or equation of motion is x dot equals to fx. F is the mapping function. So mathematical function of state variable, which tell us what's going to happen in the next step. So dynamics give us, describe the causal relation between the present state and the next state in the future. So linear dynamics, the function relationship between subsequent states is linear. So this is linear dynamic system and the system's evolution is linear. And as we can see, we can represent this with a matrix A. And if, we, if the initial condition is given, then we can derive analytically the general solution. And the solution is explicitly long for a time t. And the stability of linear dynamic system is determined by eigenvalues of matrix A. While the long linear dynamic system is difficult or sometimes impossible to solve analytically, now we have a complex function f, which is nonlinear. So components are interdependent. So x, y, z components are mixed. For example, in this one, we have x, y, z, and uh, x. So this is Lorentz system. And, uh, but we see there are multiplication of two components, x and z, and x and y. And here we, have, we see the, in the Rossler system, this is, a, this is a trajectory, or you can call it state space, and we can see the state space trajectory. And this is a Rossler uh, trajectory, and this is a Lorentz trajectory. So Lorentz system is widely used for weather forecasting, while Rossler system is used to model equilibrium in chemical reactions. Just now we looked at three-dimensional complex system, nonlinear system. Now let's have a look at one-dimensional. I, I will give you an example of one-dimensional. So first, the linear system. So xt plus 1 equals to rt, rxt. So every generation, the population of fish in a lake grows by 10%. So xt is the population of generation t. And 1.1, let's suppose, give a parameter 1.1 is the constant growth rate. Then we can, if we were given the initial population x0, 100, then we have population 100 and next generation 110, 121. So this is, can be solved. And we can also see if we have a exponential growth and we can also, this is also linear, we can analytically solve it. But now let's have a look at nonlinear relationship that is a logistic growth. So logistic map, I have to emphasize, logistic map is different from logistic regression that is commonly used in data mining. So logistic map is a, a one-dimensional nonlinear system for logistic growth. As we can see, we no longer assume the constant uh, growth rate, but the growth rate in general is proportional to the remaining capacity. So that's R1 minus xt. So which describes the behavior of a population that has limited resources and the food, water, uh, or space. 
So linear growth, exponential growth, uh, they are predictable systems with analytical solutions. But nonlinear dynamics, sometimes uh, it's not predictable. I'm going to show you. If we have r, you see here, r equals to 2.8, r equals to 3.14, r equals to 3.5, or r equals 3.8. They have totally different behaviors. The system has different behaviors. And uh, as we can see, if we have different initial conditions, during this parameter, r equals to 2.8, it converge. And however, this oscillate, periodic, peri uh, periodic 2, and the 0.1, initial conditions. But when it goes to 3.8, and the system is getting a little bit chaotic. Now let's study the possible states of this system in the long run. How does it relate to the parameter r? And this is a logistic map. At the x-axis is the growth rate, r. When we change r, the system, the attractor, this is a possible long-term values of the logistic uh, map. As we can see, when R is in the range from 0 to 1, and we have extinction system, and then we have steady state system, it converges to a constant value. Then we have periodic 2, and then periodic 4, and then we get into the chaotic region when R is greater than 3.5 and entering, approaching 4. And a slight variation of R, 0 0.001 to 0 0.002, uh, it will give big variations of the system behavior. So there's a red rectangle over here, and let's zoom in to see the system behavior, long-run behavior. As we can see, this is a zoom-in version from uh, approximately 2.8 to 4. As we can see, if we zoom in, we see a very similar picture as before. Now, let's zoom in again into this region. So this is from 3.4, approximately 3.4 to 3.6. And this is a zooming version. See, this is what people call self-similar behavior, or the fractal behavior. And the source code uh, that I wrote to generate this example is uh, publicly available in the MathWorks or website. I just downloaded into the file exchange. So let's summarize. In logistic map, a small difference in the value of R or initial value x0 can make a huge difference in the outcome of the system at time t. No formula can tell us what x will be at some speci specified time t, even if we know the initial condition, and uh, especially in the chaotic region. So the system is unpredictable. There are sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So what we have seen here, the red one, is a bifurcation diagram, uh, possible, which gave us possible long-term values of a system as a function of the bifurcation parameters uh, in the system. So, so far, I, I covered the linear dynamic system, nonlinear dynamic system, and what do we mean by nonlinear dynamics? And uh, with three-dimensional example and a, a one-dimensional logistic map example. And we have seen the bifurcation diagram and also the fractal behavior. And what do we mean by chaos? And also, now, if we have a nonlinear system, how do we analyze this nonlinear system, which requires geometric thinking? And, uh, the way we analyze the nonlinear dynamic system is different from traditional uh, way to do the time series analysis. So traditionally, if we look at the time series, for example, the EKG signal in the top panel, and we look at the time domain, so x-axis is time, and then we see the signal variations. In nonlinear analysis, we do the time delay embedding, and uh, we put xt in this x-axis, xt plus tall and xt plus 2 tall, then we will be able to reconstruct the state space trajectory. Then in, we, could look at, we could look at the shape and the topology of the EKG trajectory instead of just use the traditional ARIMA or AMA model to analyze the time series. So in this state space trajectory, we can study the divergence of the 
two trajectory, and then we can see the point care sectioning, and then what is the distribution in a particular area or a, petitional, a particular cross section, and also how they diverge, then we can derive the Pelov exponent. So that's how people uh, do the nonlinear dynamic analysis. So this is fundamentally different from traditional time series analysis. In nonlinear dynamics analysis, people look at the trajectory and the state space, high dimensional state space. And uh, people uh, often ask me a question. So we have EKG time series. We can see very straightforward information. Then why do we need to embed it in a high dimensional space? Or why do we need the geometric thinking? Now I'm going to give you an example. So an engineer observes a specific signal, but this is a flat lander view. OK, and uh, if we follow traditional time series or traditional data mining or stochastic modeling, how are you going to model this when we capture this signal? And that we may be wondering what's going on on the back, uh, back end who gen which generated this signal. As we can see, there are different frequency and also different bandwidths, right? And there, there are different timing that a particular color appears. And guess this kind of signal and how we should do it. Maybe there are transitions. We should do a Markov model, right? Maybe we should do the um, statistics, see how often they appear. That, that's, that's a traditional time, time, uh, time domain analysis or data mining approach. But if we take one step back and put this in the higher dimension, let's see what's going to happen. This is actually the system behind the signal. And this is a Plato's universe. And what we see is just a, previously, what we see is just a flat lander view. Now I hope I give you a better idea why we need to look at, have the geometric thinking that is uh, proposed by uh, Poincare to study a nonlinear dynamic system. If you have a time series, how do you, or operational data, multidimensional, how do you embed it in the, in the state space. So this will come to the Tegan's embedding theory. The state space trajectory can be reconstructed from a time series by the time delay embedding. That means if you have one dimensional time series, you can delay this time series by tall, and then you get the second dimension, and then you continue to do it until you reach d minus one dimension. So from xn plus zero tall to xn plus d minus one tall, in total, we have d dimension. So the embedding dimension is actually optimally de determined by a method called Fell's nearest neighbor for d, and time delay is determined uh, by mutual information. As we can see, this is the time domain uh, signals of EKG, and we can put it in the time domain, and then we study the examples. But the, the right-hand side is the uh, state space trajectory of the EKG signals. So we can study the shape and topology of the trajectory. And the source code to generate those ensembles and a state space trajectory are available in this link. So now let's have a look at how to capture the time delay. So if the time delay is too small, a tractor is restricted to the diagonal of the reconstructed phase space. If it is too large, components are uncorrelated, reconstructed a tractor no longer represents the true dynamics. So the general approach, the, the heuristic approach, you can do viral inspection, just choose, try a few tall values, and then look at the state space. And to see whether the tractor is, uh, or the uh, trajectory are spread out. And the disadvantage sometimes is satisfactory results only for sim simple systems. And uh, another way to do it is to use the autocorrelation function and to, uh, because we can study how the data uh, uh, autocorrelation uh, auto, uh, is autocorrelated. So optimal tor requires a linear uh, independence, and uh, which uh, is the value when the autocorrelation function first passes zero. But this is linear correlation. Sometimes system has nonlinear correlation, so which comes to the mutual information. So as we can see, this is a definition of mutual dependence of two variables. So x and y, and we have a joint distribution and probability x and y, and a log probability x and y, and then marginal 
distribution, Px and Py. So where x and y are two random variables, Px, y is joint mass function. Px, Py are marginal uh, functions. So this definition, mutual information, is derived based on the entropy, so Px log P log P, and a joint entropy, Px, y log Px, y, and a conditional entropy. So then we have the, this mutual information. Now, this mutual information function is available, and uh, I have coded it in this toolbox, and you can, uh, you can call this specific function and see how it works. So practically, how do we calculate this Rxy based on joint and marginal probabilities? So here's a practical implementation. If you, if you have the two variables, x and y, and we know we can get the marginal px, and we just project it into the x dimension, or the marginal of py. So pxy is at an x and a y location, and how many appearance of the data points inside a particular uh, box, and then you divide by the total number of data points. So that is the joint distribution, number of points in box x and y divided by total number of uh, points. And then if we plot the data in, in this way, then we will be able to derive the uh, mutual information. So embedding dimension, D. So optimal embedding dimension help us unfold the attractor. So the minimal dimension is required to reconstruct the system without any information being lost, but without adding unnecessary information. A larger dimension than the minimal leads to excess, uh, excessive computation when investigating the dynamic uh, properties. For example, I have a, a 3D uh, cup over here. If we put the 3D cup in the four-dimensional or five-dimensional, and uh, we didn't lose any information, but uh, we actually add excessive computation because we add extra dimension. So noise will populate and dominate the extra dimension of the space where no dy dynamics is operating. So here, I give an example this is a trajectory, and uh, if we project this into the one dimensional, just like the flat lander view, then this is one dimensional view of this trajectory. Okay, so Fels nearest neighbor. What is Fels nearest neighbor? The idea is to measure the distance between a state and its nearest neighbor. As the dimension increases, this distance should not change if the states are really nearest neighbors. So for the previous trajectory, if we project this into, for example, A, B, C, if we project into the one dimension, as we can see, who is the true labor of A? So we have a point A here. So obviously C is the true labor, but when B is projected to the one dimension, B becomes the far, false neighbor. False neighbor, that means we pro, because we projecting to a lower dimension, then this data point B, originally it is not a neighbor of A, but when we project, it will become a neighbor of A. So what do we do is we go from one dimension to two dimension until we find that the near, false nearest neighbor number is decreasing, okay? We don't have more false nearest neighbors. So any object, 3D object we have in the room, we can project into one dimension. We will have a lot of false nearest neighbors. But if we expand it into two dimensional, we will have less. Three dimensional pretty much is fully expanded. In four dimensional, we also have less nearest neighbors, even if this object is three dimensional, right? So we need to test different dimensions and see how many, uh, what is the proportion of false nearest neighbor we have in, when we put this system in a particular dimension. So the false nearest neighbor source code is also available in this toolbox. So the general computation is, suppose we put this xr is the r nearest neighbor of xn in the d-dimensional space. And uh, the Euclidean distance between this xr n and xn, this is the distance in the d-dimensional space. Now we are gonna increase one more dimension. 
that means we're going to add d. You see here, this is d minus 1, right? From 0 to d minus 1. So in total, we have d dimension. Now we're going to go one more dimension, that is d. And then we get the extra calculation of the neighboring calculation. We want to see how much change we have. So this will become false nearest neighbor criterion. We can now look at the relative ch change in the distance as a way to see if the states were not really close together when increased to a higher dimension. So, so far, we talked about if we have time series, we, we have data, how to, why it is necessary for us to look at it in the higher dimension or have a geometric thinking, and how to put the data into the higher dimension that is taken in embedding theory. Now let's look at it. If we put the data in the higher dimension, how do we look at the behavior of the system? That is the recurrence theory and the heterogeneous recurrence analysis. So point K has recurrence theory, and which states that T uh, be a marrow preserving transformation of a probability space. And then for any natural number, N belongs to the natural number N, the trajectory will eventually reappear at a neighborhood A of former state. Okay, so that means this x belongs to A, and then t steps later belongs to this space, but it does not belong to A. Is actually the probability is zero. That means eventually it will reappear in the neighborhood of A, and that will also be the first return. That is a minimal n. It's come back to the neighborhood of n. And uh, recurrence behaviors are very common in, the, in, the, in our nature. For example, in the manufacturing, we have power consumption signals. We see some recurrent behaviors when we uh, just process the work pieces. And also, we can see the human heartbeat, one beat, next beat. There are recurrences. But there are all periodic recurrences. And also, there are recurrence variations, which help us capture the system behaviors and also the anomaly and uh, disease in the human heart. And uh, if we look at another example every year around uh, October, this time we come back to informs. That's a recurrence too. But not strictly at the exactly the same date. Right. So recurrence plot, uh, as we previously discussed, we put the data in a higher dimensional space. Now, in higher dimensional space, we, if we look at a state, and we, if we put a circle over there, and we see some neighbors or recurrences, and because that's neighborhood A, and we see some coming back, some states after a while, it will come back. So the recurrence plot represents those times at which the system recurs to a former state. That is, a trajectory visits the same neighborhood in the state space. And, uh, this is a state, and uh, we can go into different areas, and then we come back. This is a recurrence. And uh, this is another state. For example, this is a state. And then when it has come back, I will mark another dot over here. I will say uh, I have already, the system actually returned to this neighborhood. And uh, how do we get the trajectory? We can do, if, we ha if you have multi-dimensional signals, you can use real-world signals. And uh, if you have single dimension signals, you can do the taken embedding uh, uh, of the uh, state space. So if, let's have a look at this recurrence plot. The x-axis is a state. Y-axis is also a state index. And which, if we pick a state in the x-axis, for example, 400, if we go vertically, we will be able to identify those states that return to the neighborhood of state 400. And if we go to another one, 800, we will see the return of all the neighbors of state 800. So this, is, this gives us a way that we characterize the state space and also the behaviors of the state space. So there are very intriguing or interesting patterns in the recurrence plot and the structures. As we can see, if we have periodic systems, and like a sign, and uh, we see streak nines and, uh, because we keep coming back and uh, deterministically. And uh, if we have Lorentz time series, and uh, we see intermittent behavior along the diagonal lines, that means the periodicity is disrupted. 
and uh, we see some breakup of the diagonal lines. And uh, they, they are inter intermittent behaviors. And also sometimes there are vertical uh, stability or vertical delays in the state transitions. But if we have a random noise, you see we have a very random system. So the small scale structure, that is the single dots, single dots, diagonal and vertical lines, diagonal lines and vertical lines. So large scale structures are homogeneous and periodic disrupted patterns, which tell us a great deal of information about the periodicity, noise, intermittent behaviors, and uh, uh, homogeneity and uh, non-stationarity. Because if there are very strong vertical lines, that means they are, we are shifting into a new uh, regime or area of the state space. But we talk about the recurrence, and then well, we get started to study recurrence, and we found that uh, there are different types of recurrence. Because previously we talked about recurrence can happen at different areas of the trajectory. How do we, and if we treat them all as black dots, right? So they become homogeneous. So for example here, we have two pair of recurrent states. So from 15, 17, 19, they recur one, three, and five. So one state X has three values, there are three dimensions. This is a recurrence. But this recurrence is very much different from 32, 34, and 36, and then 30, 32, 34. So they, they are different recurrence types, type one or type two. So how do we capture this different type of recurrence? Then we were thinking about, oh, we gotta have a new idea, which is called state, state uh, space indexing. We, we wanna see which area my system is evolved evolving into, and we want to count at that specific area how many recurrence we have, the degree of recurrence we have. Then we borrow an idea from database management because they are multi-dimensional data indexing, which, help, which helps speed up data retrieval and data query in very large database. And uh, then we said, why not? We do the state space indexing using the uh, using the tree, arc tree, and uh, then we can separate the state space into different areas, then we can mark them. Now after that, we can map each state, xn, into a k belongs to a set of areas in the state space. Then we do the iterative function system, that is, we give each state a uh, address, cxn, cyn, which is based on the previous state, and also based on where they are. The K is where they are, which area in the state space they are. And then we do a, a, a little bit of shift of the previous address and also plus the area that they are, sine and cosine, so that we can have a circular diagram. So initially, initial address is zero, zero. So let's have a look at this example. So in the y-axis, you see here we have one, two, three, four, five, six to eight. We have eight areas or eight regions in the state space. And uh, now when the, when, when the system is evolving, right, in the state space, when it comes to the region seven, so the system getting to region seven, then I give an address and uh, here is this address is, and we give initial address zero, zero, and now this is the first point, one, one. So what we have is point one, point one, zero, zero, and then we know this is in the regime seven, then we have a sine cosine. And now we got the address of the first state is over here. Now, when it comes to the six, when it comes to the six, the red means the current state. When it comes to the six, we are entering the region or uh, 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 the region six. Now we know the previous address, 0.707 minus 0.707. Now we put it in because it's based on the second state is based on the previous state and also based on where the, it is right now, six, right? So this is uh, area six. And then we got the new address, 
right here. Then we continue to do it. This is three, then this is a three. And we continue to do it, three again. You see, although these two states, both of them, they're entering region three, but they are slightly different. Why? Because the force, this is Cx4, Cy4, is actually dependent on the previous state. We have a slight deviation in this region. So if we continue going, and then the IFH address is unique for every state. Two states have the same address if and only if they share the same categorical variable, or the same, they are entering the same region, and all of their previous states are the same. Okay, so this is the IF transformation, the or we can call it a fractal diagram, because if we zoom in, it will be another circular diagram. You see here, this is a Markov process, and then we generate a series of data. Now let's see, we have one, two, three, four, and then to region eight. Now, if we zoom in eight, we got uh, one to eight, two to eight, three to eight, and we got another circular diagram. As you may see, this is self-similar behavior, and this also gives us fractal view of the data. And uh, if we want to look into it, we can go continue to dive into the diagram. We can see 1, 2, 8, 2, 2, 8, 3, 2, 8. And we can continue to zoom in. If we have enough big data, then we can keep zooming. So what you can capture is single state distribution, two state sequence transition, three state sequence transition, and a four state, and then you can keep going. And this is very useful for us to uh, check the uh, system, especially monitoring the system. Uh, the, the, the. So because we have the diagram, and we can quantify the variation in those, uh, in those IFS diagrams. So what we did is, First, how many of them in a particular region? State one, K1, K2, KL. This kind of transition appear how many times? And also recurrence uh, uh, rate. This is a heterogeneous recurrence rate. And uh, this is the cardinality. And these are the set. The first one is the set. How many of them in different areas? What time do we appear? in this state sequence. And also this is the rate, this is the mean in each area, and this is the entropy, that are with the distribution in each circle. So because we got the recurrence quantifiers, now we can uh, do the uh, process monitoring, use those quantifiers. But traditionally, we, we assume the variables are independent, but sometimes they are correlated, they are dependent. And then if we know the mean and the covariance, then it will automatically follow chi-square, but we have unknown population mean and covariance. We have to estimate it from the data. So we know the sample, uh, sample covariance and the sample mean, and uh, replace the population mean and the covariance with sample mean, sample covariance. So, and then we will be able to, uh, what if the sample covariance matrix is singular? then we can add a particular variation into it. And the, the detailed information, how to tackle the singular problem is available in this paper. Yeah. So now let me take one step back, how to apply and connect with engineering applications. This is a manufacturing example, ultra precision machining. As we can see, there are signals, acoustic emission, vibration, and a cutting force. And we have this paper detail the development of heterogeneous recurrence monitoring of dynamic transient in ultra-precision machining process. And uh, when we machine the surface, machine the surface is in good quality if the surface finish is within 100 nanometers. As we can see, the left is a very flat surface, and the right is greater than 100 nanometers. And so we got a rough surface, and we want to study the difference based on the sensor signals. And uh, then based on the data, sensor signals, we will be able to 
extract and we can plot the transitions and based on the transitions we can extract the recurrence uh, behaviors or the quantifiers. Then we can see that this is a traditional method, top panel A and B, and this is what we have for the heterogeneous recurrence. We can see when RA changes, traditional uh, methods cannot distinguish from the sensor signals. However, the new method can distinguish the behavior, the, the surface finish variations from the sensor signals. So here is another example for the cardiac system. You know, when, when, he, in, when the human heart is beating, we actually have EKG signals. But people often think, oh, EKG signals is just one-dimensional signal, but a heart is a three-dimensional heart. When heart is beating, the electric wave propagates in the three-dimensional space. So if you only take, a, for example, a, a variable sensor, you only get a one-dimensional EKG. That means you are looking at uh, a person or the heart only from one angle. So if you want to get a comprehensive idea about the heart, you got to look at the heart from multiple angles. So that's why if we only rely on one-dimensional EKG, sometimes we, got, uh, we, we can miss very, uh, uh, very important disease or uh, the cardiac events. If we look at the trajectory, if there are multiple, uh, if there are like a, a disease, disease actually varies the trajectory in the space, because you can think if the damage in the heart, which actually push the electric wave to a different direction, so the trajectory actually changes. So if we use the heterogeneous recurrence rate, then we will be able to tell the cardiac event detect very quickly. Those are the example of heterogeneous uh, recurrence monitoring. Now, that's, so far, we finished the nonlinear dynamics, a brief introduction of nonlinear dynamics, and why we need to look at the state space trajectory and also the geom uh, geometry of the state space trajectory. Recurrence is one way to look at the trajectory and the geometry topology in the state space. There's another way called a self-organizing uh, network, and uh, that's getting to a new concept, self-organizing network. So network analysis. For some time, we have known topology. We know who is whose friend, and in the social network, and you can extract those data because they are linked, they are followed, right? And uh, in the computer network, and we have hollow wires, all the Wi-Fi, we connect all the computers together. And uh, in disease, and uh, we also have different variations, and uh, they are connected in COVID-19. So network representation, the adjacent matrix A is a means of representing which nodes of a network are adjacent to other nodes. If node I and J are linked, we give a one. If it is, they are not linked, we give a zero. So that's AIJ. So network statistics help us statistically quantify the physical networks. But if we know the network topology, we can get the adjacent matrix. But now, if we have the adjacent matrix, can we derive the physical topology? So this is one paper that we published to answer this question. So if we have a time series, so how do we derive a network? There are two different ways. So give a time, uh, time series. We can reconstruct the state space, and D is the embedding dimension, tau is time delay. And uh, if we assume a node xi is connected to its k nearest neighbors, but excluding the nodes in the same strand of the trajectory. So this is called a stellar window. You see here, this node is connected to k neighbors. This node is connected to k neighbors. Then we immediately we can derive a network and also the uh, adjacent matrix. However, recur but previously the neighbor, the number of neighbor is fixed for every node because every node got k neighbors. But this one is based on the recurrence. That means if, if we draw a ball around this state, we will be able to find the labors. But at a different area, we might find less labors. So the recurrence are treated as links in the network. And the adjacent matrix is obtained 
from the recurrence matrix by removing the diagonal identities. Okay, so this is a new recurrence network. So once we got the adjacent matrix K, uh, uh, adjacent matrix A, AIJ, we will be able to derive the node degree, KI. KI is the number of neighboring nodes of node I. If we look at the adjacent matrix, and uh, KI equals to the sum of all the J, and the I, J, pretty much the, all the rows, one row in the adjacent matrix, the first one, node degree. A link density is the ratio of the number of edges to the number of possible edges. So that means AIJ, and uh, because there are so many links inside the AIJ, and we just count how many ones we have in AIJ, and then divide by total number of possible edges. This will be link density. Distance, DIJ, is the minimum number of edges to travel from node I to node J. And the average path length is the average of all paired distances, dij. So diameter d is the longest of all shortest paths. Clustering coefficient of node is the probability of two neighbors of a node i are also neighbors. So as we can see from the definition, most of the network measures or metrics, they are derived or calculated from adjacent metrics. So for example, if we have this network, and we can see for every node, we can calculate the load degree. So the distance between node A and B is six. That means travel six edges, we, I will be able to travel from A to B. So average path length is 2.3210, and the clustering coefficient is 90% for node one, zero, node 20, and 100% node 27. So average clustering coefficient is 62.7. But those, we only, in the adjacent matrix, we only count one. We only have one, zero. So network measures, can we not based on one or zero, but use the actual node to node difference? And if we want to use the actual node to node di distance, then we have to derive the network topology from the adjacent matrix. That means give you an adjacent matrix. Tell me, well, uh, self-organize a topology for me. But adjacent matrix, you see, is zero and a one. How can we go from adjacent matrix to topology? So we could have, for, for the same adjacent matrix, we could have a variable of topologic structure for the network. For example, these two, the link, they are the same. Right? They are all derived from the same adjacent matrix. But the shape is a little bit different. Which one should we use? Right? Is that a unique and stable topologic structure for a recurrence network? And this is studied in this paper. And uh, for details, uh, you may dive into technical details, you may dive into uh, this paper. But I'm going to show you an example how to derive the network topology. As you can see, this is an uh, adjacent matrix. Okay, this is the adjacent matrix, and now these two are self-organizing. As you may notice, they start from different initial conditions, but the connections, they all follow this uh, zero and one pattern. As, uh, as we use the self-organizing algorithms to organize the network, you see the energy actually drops when the network topology is starting to form a shape. And when it converge, we will possibly see a same topology. But let's see whether they are the same. So for, a, for an adjacent matrix, the self-organizing approach yields a unique and a stable network topology structure by minimizing the system energy, even from different initial settings. As we can see, we approximately reach this plateau phase, and this adjacent matrix gave us a very interesting butterfly shape from two different initial conditions. So that means we could do it, right? Now, 
how could we use this in the engineering design? You know, very interesting. Self-organizing network recovers the geometry of 3D design. So which disclose the geometry of a re recurrence network, provide a new way for optimal matching and retrieval of engineering designs. As you can see from the random initial setting, as we evolve, it will become a chair. Now, if we can capture this in the network matrix, you see, it will become linear algebra, and we can match different design in the database. Instead of doing deep learning of the 3D point cloud, you see, it will getting very, very easy to use and easy to retrieve and easy to match 3D designs. And uh, now let's see an animation how this self-organizing process works. From the initial conditions, we see the it, it actually self-organizing into a chair. So the self-organizing process of recurrence network for a chair and uh, this animation is available in my YouTube channel. And uh, so this is for the computer chair. And the people may want, may be wondering if we change to a different design, will it still work? Okay, now let's look at this. What is this? It's uh, random, and we, we haven't figured out what it is yet, right? So, but it, it's dancing. Dancing, and uh, then it emerged to be a right, um, very beautiful dance. <laughs> and this is an ant. <laughs> so self-organizing process for an ant. And uh, because ant has a lot of like uh, angles and the feet, so it takes longer time to self-organize. Because the, the more complex the geometry is, and the, the longer time it will take to reduce the energy. Mm. And this is another example of the drone. And uh, we also start from the random layout. And uh, using the recurrence network approach, we will be able, and, and uh, leverage the self-organizing algorithms, we will be able to reconstruct the 3D designs. And uh, the detailed algorithm is available uh, in the in the paper that uh, we just referred in the previous page. So so far, uh, I talked about uh, a brief introduction of nonlinear dynamics, and then we dive into recurrent theory and heterogeneous recurrent theory, and then we talk about self-organizing network, and uh, we covered uh, uh, a few uh, these topics, and uh, most of the demos and uh, the uh, the links are shown in this slide. And also, you can find those links in the PDF tutorial available in the Informs website. So at the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, editors, uh, Doug and uh, Harry and uh, Ibru, and anonymous reviewers, and the wonderful editorial team I have uh, worked with. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad I have the pleasure and the opportunity to work with you guys. At the same time, I want to acknowledge my advisor, uh, Dr. Satish Bukhapadanam, I learned nonlinear dynamics from him, and uh, my collaborator, and also my mentor when I was assistant professor, Dr. Eric Bennett, and uh, wonderful students, and uh, I have worked with all the PhD students in my lab, and yeah, some of them they are tenured associate professor and now tenure track assistant professor. So far, my lab has graduated about uh, eight tenure track assistant professor and one tenured associate professor so far. In the, I, I anticipate maybe in the next two years, we will have more tenured associate professor <laughs> from my lab, yeah. So, and also I would like to acknowledge my sponsors uh, from NIH, NSF, and without, and also industry, uh, industry partners. Without their uh, support and collaboration, and this work will, would not be possible. So here is my contact information, and uh, I will be happy to uh, uh, talk more in details and, uh, and answer any questions you may have. Please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It was a, I really enjoyed the presentation, and there was, a, I think, the first sort of thing that occurred to me, that there was some sort of sense of 
mystery or wonder that sort of permeated the talk uh, and that came through all the examples so something uh, very interesting yeah so uh, let's let's uh, open it up to the audience first uh, if anybody has a question i can bring the mic over and maybe this is a redundant question fascinating what you're doing with the self organizing can you explain in layman's terms i'll say how you get the i can understand how you take the connectivity matrix and that produces something but like when you produce a chair or an ant or a drone how does it get the distances between those related and the unrelated pieces oh that's a wonderful question what a <laughs> <Okay>. wonderful question <laughs> yeah and that's that's uh that's a big question it would probably take another <laughs> a talk to answer this question but briefly i i i think uh Self-organizing algorithms actually leverage the, the connectivity and also the connections among all the dots, all the nodes. And uh, because the nodes, the adjacent matrix already capture those topologic information. So what we did is just reconstruct it through the self-organizing algorithms. Because, yeah, by reducing the energy. But as to the details, how to reduce the energy and how to calculate the energy, and, uh, and also how to optimally choose the parameters. Those are very technical details. And uh, uh, I, I do have uh, a very detailed paper uh, uh, in many pages and I, I could share with you. And uh, so then we can talk more about uh, the self-organizing and uh, network and how it can be applied into different uh, areas. Related question to that, again, from a basis of complete ignorance. Um, if it's self-organizing and you talked about starting with, a, I'll say, a random cloud of points. So would this give you a, mecha, a method for saying I've got this connectivity matrix, which took measurements from, I'll say, this perspective and another mm -hmm. connectivity matrix that took measurements from a different perspective and then say, since these self-organize into the same result, could you do a comparison at the raw matrix level and say they're really the same thing? And would that give you like a vision recognition system or something like that? I'm really jumping off into space on you. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I actually uh, propose to do. Because my goal is not just the self-organizing. My goal is actually using this for provide a new way for optimal matching and retrieval of engineering designs. Because in this world, you see, uh, we have deep learning of the image, right? The image, they are very regularized data. We, but uh, Google has image search, has text search, and but uh, it's, um, uh, you may not see the 3D data search, right? 3D or 3D object search, it's very difficult to implement at this moment. And uh, what I propose is, uh, just as you, in, as you vision that, uh, because the matrix, right, we can, capture the matrix, the matrix actually reduce the dimension from like 3D design to the 2D. And then all the linear algebra can come into play and help us to optimize the match and retrieve of 3D design. And uh, in, in other words, if you have a chair and uh, you want to search a similar chair, you can just throw it into the search engine and then it will uh, be able to derive uh, like a two-dimensional connectivity matrix, and then it will be able to match all similar chairs and then provide the feedback to you. Excuse me, it's fascinating stuff. So the connectivity matrix, like do you start with two or three pictures to get a three-dimensional buildup, and then you say this point has a gray connection to that point, therefore they're connected, or this point is touching white space so they're not connected? Is that kind of how it builds it up? Uh, in industry, there are different ways to do it. Okay. And because I the front end sensing, uh, there are different ways. There are industry scanners and uh, that image based uh, 3D reconstruction. And uh, yeah, the LIDAR, LIDAR sensors. And I was amazed in the Phoenix Street, I saw the Weimar, and uh, they have LIDAR sensors rotating, right? So th they all give you 3D point cloud. And what I propose is we leverage this kind of data and then we can derive new ways to self-organize the network and for uh, matching and retrieval. Yeah, thank you very much. Wonderful question. Just want to have a, ask a clarification question. I, I, I don't quite understand um, sure, how please. this has to do with, I mean, have the self-organizing network or, or I mean, maybe there is maybe there is a missing 
component here between the recurrence and uh, Tarkin's theorem and this self-organization. I, 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 I don't understand the linkages between um, the, 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 the previous parts and this part. Maybe I think there was a, there was a slide uh, which was related to how you actually embed mm -hmm. uh, networks. I think, I think and, and, and I was not very clear about how that embedding is related to uh, uh, Tarkin's embedding. I, I have to say in this talk, I try to cover a wide spectrum of my research and uh, in manufacturing, healthcare, in networks, recurrence, and also in the uh, nonlinear dynamics. So what I did is, so basic idea is you have sensors, and the sensor give you data. And uh, once you got the data, you can look at it from statistic perspective. What I propose is a, a different way to look at the data and the geometric thinking of the data and look at the, because it's dynamic data, it's actually changing over time. So you can embed it into the higher dimensional space. Then you can look at the different uh, perspectives of the data. Of course, it does not preclude the traditional way to analyze from the data mining a statistic modeling perspective. But this is another way to do the statistic modeling and geometric thinking. So sensing is give us data, then we do the modeling. Modeling can be done in two different ways and uh, uh, can be done multiple different ways. And then it will, uh, we extract uh, information, then we support the, uh, for me, uh, I'm engineers and uh, industrial engineers, so I do uh, more from the control uh, perspective, but uh, we can also do from the decision making and the optimization perspective. So that's what I call sensing, modeling, and optimization. We should uh, uh, keep it in a coherent uh, uh, framework. So then I cover the, I want to just uh, expand the linkage between different components. So the first component is uh, nonlinear dynamics. I, I want to give a premiere or dive into nonlinear dynamics. The fundamental difference from nonlinear dynamics thinking and traditional data mining thinking. And then, uh, based on the trajectory, we can look at the uh, uh, recurrence, means we show up at different locations in the geometry or uh, in the topology. And then how does it relate to system behavior? And, and the recurrence, because recurrence can also help us do the network, because network can be done with, uh, by counting the neighbors and which can also be done by counting how many recurrences we have in the state space. And there is a different way. The self-organizing net, net, self network, there are different applications. One way is to study the time series. Time series can be embedded in the state space. Then you can study the, from the network recurrence network perspective. And just now, when I show the animation, I actually showed a different paper that studies the uh, engineering design more from the, the from the application point of view. Yeah. So that's how it, it is connected. There are network behaviors, recurrence behaviors, and uh, yeah, and in the in the state space, and also there are different behaviors. There are fractal behaviors too. I haven't covered in this tutorial so, yet. So mm -hmm. maybe let me ask the, me this sure. clarification question. So what is the state space in self-organizing networks? This is the part I don't really quite connect. So which part is nonlinear dynamics in the self-organizing networks? This is the part I don't really connect. Okay. The second the thing is that I do not know what the each does, what are the dynamics is representing here. So, so this is something that I, I, I probably not missing here. Um, you know, and, uh, let me elaborate your question. Your question is uh, how state space is uh, connected with uh, uh, recurrence network. Is that the question? I think it's the self, in the self organ. I mean, if I can really paraphrase, maybe uh, the first two. I think up to the last part, it's relatively clear that there is you're trying to find these recurrences. Yes. And, uh, I think maybe in the self organizing network, uh, there's no time element. Is that what you're saying? Uh, so there, there's no time element. At least uh, when we first look at the chair thing, it mm -hmm. seems to be like a point cloud type of. Mm -hmm. uh, not a point cloud, maybe just an adjacency matrix representation. So maybe the, the, the question is coming from, that seems different from like a time element, and uh, maybe that's... Oh, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Yeah. I, I, and uh, as I said, recurrence network can be, can be used to study time series, and then the network will change over time. Then that dynamics will come into play. And, uh, but your question is more about the second part, point cloud, right? 
So it's in point timing. cloud, where is the dynamic? Where, where dynamics emerge? So in point cloud, in point cloud, in, in point cloud, the the, the chair. Uh, I have to say point cloud the dynamics is actually the energy change from the beginning to the to the end when we converge. That is one way we can see the dynamics. The second thing, if you can say a chair doesn't uh, change of a, uh, at a particular time, and uh, yeah, that's that's right. But uh, any 3D object, we, they will change over time. And uh, then you will have another degree of dynamics. So that's that's what I'm uh, trying to deliver the dynamics in two different ways, yeah. So, so to summarize, you're saying that the, the actual uh, derivation of the chair, you're going through different states to actually come up to this chair form. Mm -hmm. And so that is your sort of yeah, that evolution. That is organizing the, evolution. It's a kind of time factor, yeah. but mm -hmm. you know, in that way um, is similar to the previous ones. Yeah, and, and, and also that uh, this chair and also this, uh, this chair are very similar, but there are different type of chairs and uh, vary from chair to chair. There are also a different degree of dynamics. And I still don't understand what I mean by convergence, because if, you, if you're talking about convergence, that means that my dynamics is already known. Um, so, so if you do have, and I think, I, I guess the purpose is try to figure out what the dynamics are from the data. So my inputs are the data, and then output should be, I, I, according to my understanding, is input is the data, output is dynamics. But, but right now you're telling me that, okay, um, I, I, I have this, dy something converges. So, so actually you know the dynamics and try to show, okay, something converges. So this is something really in my mind, I don't really understand what exactly it is about. Is it, what's the input and what is output? What's the cause? What's the effect in this context? So the question about the input did also occur to me. So your input is going to be a particular chair's adjacency mm -hmm. um, matrix. Mm -hmm. And you know it's a chair, but you know the algorithm doesn't know it's a chair. Yeah. And so it just has the adjacency matrix of a chair. Uh -huh. And uh, then it, and, and that adjacency matrix would correspond to multiple possible 3D yes. figures. And you're trying to find the figure that is the most that is the best uh, fit to your adjacency matrix somehow. Is it? Yeah. yeah. So I, I also had uh, along the same lines. Obviously, there's lots of details, I'm sure. But uh, let me just check the time. But maybe you can answer that question if that's. Uh, we have maybe you can have spend one more minute on this. It is two o'clock. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question, and uh, so. Uh, but in general, I I, I didn't uh, quite get the question. So. So the question is, uh, if there is a convergence, then there is no dynamics. Is that a question? If the, if, if, if the energy com, uh, converge, right, if we do the calculation, the energy converge, then there is no uh, dynamics. And, uh, and the second question is, what is the input and what is the output? Is that, is that? Uh, yeah, it has probably to do with, and I think we, all of us understand the, it's kind of very fascinating, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think, I guess we're just asking for more details and, and I think that's, you know, what, how it started. Sure, 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 sure. But, but yeah, so we, I understand if it's not, it's difficult to convey all of it in, in, uh, in a short time, obviously. If you had one final thoughts on it, then we could sort of, uh, um, uh, maybe you could point us to a paper. Maybe that could be another. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there, that there, there different uh, le levels of papers to describe the recurrence-based uh, complex networks. I see. And uh, I have to say, uh, people study networks uh, from different perspectives, but uh, this network approach is uh, uh, focused on uh, data, and uh, I, I think the data is evolving over time. And if you look at the time series, for one segment of time series, we can derive the network data. And then the next window, the network will change. Yeah, but if you, uh, if we get the recurrence network, for example, you have a, you have a time series, and if you have a one window, you can derive the network. Next window, you can get another ne network. And then this is another way to capture the, 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 because the data is from a system. Then when the data change, when the network change, there's another way to monitor or study the system behavior. So that's where the dynamics, if you, if you say the dynamics is from the system, 
and uh, then it causes the data to change, right? And then it causes the network to change. And so that's one way that we can look at the dynamics. And uh, the other way, if we look at the dynamics from, from the how the process, if we, if, we just, if we were just given the matrix, for example, this matrix, you don't know it is a chair or not. Right? It is corresponding to this topology or the other topology. And as you are self-organizing the, uh, the, uh, all the chair, and uh, then you have energy variations. When I say energy, that's the network energy variations. So then when the energy converge, then eventually you got a stable structure. So you may call this dynamics, or you can call it, uh, it is different, it's, it's in a different term. But uh, that's fine, but uh, that's a process that we get it, uh, get it uh, in, into the final shape. So in the interest of time, we can, we can move this offline. Yeah, we, we can get, talk yeah. more offline. Yes. But thank you for the very good question. Yeah, yeah. And I, I have a couple of more things I'll ask you. Sure. With, with the, with the, yeah, let's thank uh, the speaker one more time, and then uh, thank you.